you can't fix the person. For all your love, for all your care, all your intelligence, all your education, unless you're a psychiatrist or a medical professional, a psychologist, a, a, a trained therapist, someone who really understands the workings of the mind and hasn't got an investment in you, is not your wife, your, is, is not in your family, someone who's outside who you can tell every horrible little tiny thing that you've done uh, and they won't judge you and say, oh, you did not do that. <laughs> oh, yes, I did. <laughs> no, but that, that is the key. Uh, but what you have to be is an advocate for the person. You have to fight for that person. You can't push them away. You have to bring them in. You have to give them love, give them comfort, and help them understand that they can't keep living this way. They're hitting one obstacle after the other, one dead end after the other with their bad choices, with their bad actions, with their lack of thought of the consequences of what they're doing, and the misery that they're living in, and the depression they're living in. And some people will think their depression is deserved for something they did. If they're a, strongly, if they're, they're a strong member of a religious organization that uses guilt and fear to control particularly women, they'll think they're being punished by God, by this miserable life they live in. Uh, no, no, that is not what is happening. We are forgiven all the time for everything we do. We just has to have to ask for it. A forgiveness and redemption is part of the daily stuff of life. You can get over it. And what's this about two chances and you're out. No, no, you, it's not just a second chance that you deserve in life. You get chances over, over, and over again until you're dead to, to correct yourself and correct your behavior and correct your life and change your way you think and change the way you are. So that, that's the kind of thing I'm trying to tell in my book and I hope it, it, it is a message that people will listen to because it comes from my heart and it comes from what I've seen in the last four years I've traveled the country talking to groups such as yours, uh, mostly mental health, not such as a literary group like this, but mental health groups and hospitals and, and people, and I get women of, a, of our age everywhere uh, who are just so concerned about their family members, their daughters, their sons, and what can they do? Uh, there isn't the response that we need in the community. Uh, there isn't enough funds. There isn't enough funding for mental health, and yet it's the second biggest cost to our mental health to our national health care. Um, when I started speaking four years ago, it was, it was 13 billion. I thought, oh, that's shocking, 13 billion. It's up to 12, 55 billion uh, dollars now is, is we spend on, uh, because we, it, it's a cost to the economy of mental health uh, issues in our, uh, the lack of productivity, the, uh, there's just so many things that come into it to make this statistic. Cardiovascular disease is number one. We're all getting health smart. We're we're all watching our hearts. The the, the we're, we're, we've got that one under control. So in very short time, I think that uh, we'll get to be number one. <laughs> no, not a good thing. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to move to questions Please. now. Um, and I was hoping to ask you a little bit more about. Um, oh, good luck. About, <laughs> <laughs> you don't need me here. Yeah. Um, while we're waiting for people to come up, and again, try to keep the questions short so that we can get as many in as possible. Have you got one question? I feel badly. Have you got a specific question? Yeah, what's this, dying to what's ask this me? dwarf tossing that's going on at your house? Oh, <laughs> that was. There is a wonderful series of, of paintings that we we have from uh, Jamaica. They're primitive, wonderful Jamaican artists, and it's Queen Victoria in her black dress with her white hat on the beach in Jamaica, and there's all all the guards and all the pomp and circumstance and everything. And it's dwarf tossing contests. They're, they're tossing little people back and forth. And my children always thought this was very funny. It's not against little people. It's just humor and art and, and funny. And, and so we toss the babies. I mean, I don't. They the toss boys the do. babies. Sash yeah. and Justin toss the baby. I mean, from here to that camera. Ooh, and the everyone's going, oh, no. And look at them very small. They are tossed. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a new family ritual around the Trudeau household now. Tossing the babies. Not we're quite Heaving bad. the babies into the air. They're always okay. caught and they're squealing with delight. <laughs> and the mothers are going, oh no. <laughs> 
<laughs> we have a question over here. Yes, please. Hello, Margaret. Hello. You're wonderful. Thank I love you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. And thank for you sharing, for being here. Sharing your life and your experiences with everybody. Um, I wonder if, you, like you, you've talked about everything you've been through, but now you're making, um, you're doing something positive. I believe it's in Africa, and it's providing clean water. Oh, yes, yes. Could you talk a bit about that? Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, my grandmother had always taught, my grandmother was a great influence on me, Rose Bernard. She was a very tough uh, Manitoba prairie woman uh, who raised all her, her, her siblings when her mother died in a flu epidemic when she was only 12, and she had all these small children. She was tough, and she lived up the coast, and I spent all my summers with her. And she always said, Margaret, when you give, you get back in spades. And, I, and she always did so much in her community and so much helping, and she was sort of the role model for me in that. And I, I started working for Watercan, uh, which is a, a, an organization, a Canadian one, that uh, we put clean water into the poorest, poorest villages in sub-Saharan Africa. We used to work around the world, but now we, we're focused where the need is greatest and we're, where we're most efficient. Uh, 28 million people in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa are affected by the AIDS virus. Uh, the t dirty water does not cause the AIDS virus, uh, does not cause AIDS. But of course, AIDS compromises your immune system terribly. So the dirty water that uh, is given to the babies who have AIDS, who drink it, kills them immediately. The mothers suffer terribly uh, from the dirty water, and they die quickly uh, if they have AIDS. AIDS is, is a disease that is ravaging Africa and the women and children. Uh, unfortunately, one of the, the one of the problems is, is that uh, the women, uh, when they go to fetch water, often they have to go 10 kilometers, 7 kilometers away from their villages, the mothers and the children and the girls, because water in Africa is only women's work. Men don't touch water. They don't lift it. They don't carry it. They don't do anything. It's just part of their tradition. And so the women do all the water. And, and when they're out there on this long trek to, uh, to the water hole, um, they're often attacked uh, sexually. Uh, assaulted by um, roving bands in jeeps with guns, and I, you know who they are, and they just, uh, it's terrible for the women, and the AIDS is causing such devastation. But it's not, it's, so it's not just the AIDS and the sexual assault. Uh, water is the gift of life. We take it for granted in this country, uh, and we shouldn't, because our water is getting as polluted as anywhere on the earth, and we've really got to uh, conserve, preserve, and not waste our water. We've got to treat it as the most precious thing we have on earth because it is it's life sustaining it's the gift of life so by going over to i started with this organization um when Allie was just six, my daughter was just six, and she's 20 or 22, so I guess 16 years ago. And just as a volunteer, I was with her on a field trip. I saw this, uh, um, I saw this booth uh, where water can was showing the children how to filter water and what, what clean water was all about. And I said, who are you and how can I help? Because when I'd been traveling around the world with Pierre, uh, I'd really seen that the difference between a thriving, successful community or town or city was its access to safe, clean water. And, and ones that are really suffering, it's usually the water that is the problem. It's the start of the problem. We go into Africa, we clean up the water. We're not missionaries. We take the funds over. We're not trying to change anything else about these absolutely beautiful, joyful people who live in such sorrow because they lose so many of their children. They, there's so much death in their small villages from water. So we, we clean up the water. And it's a wonderful thing to do. And I I think water can has, it's a wonderful thing to volunteer and to get outside. I think my suffering is bad. I know that the suffering that I went through losing Michelle is as bad as it gets. So there's nothing worse than losing a child. There couldn't be, couldn't be. And these mothers are losing their child, all their children. They lose them one after the other. And I, I found myself that by helping and going outside of my own misery and by giving help to those who cannot help themselves, these women know that the water is causing their children's death. There's nothing they can do about it. They know they should boil it for five minutes. They don't have enough firewood. They need to use the firewood to heat the heat the dinner for their husbands and the, the family. They can't use use a, use the firewood for boiling water.